Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 105, The Dave Allison Hockey Journey, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pedlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we chop some wood, carry some water, and begin this conversation, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and you want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. My next guest, Dave Allison, is a well-known and respected figure in the world of ice hockey. As a player, he had a solid career that spanned 10 years professionally, spending time in the American Hockey League, the International Hockey League, as well as a brief stint in the NHL with the Montreal Canadiens. Mr. Allison showed he had some offensive potential in juniors with the Cornwall Royals, as well as a few years when he was a pro, but there was something else that drew him in that he specialized in, and that has to do with two guys leading with their fists. If you look at his career penalty minutes, when you see numbers like 298 minutes, 302, 332, 337, and 407 penalty minutes in a season, you're choosing to be a professional hockey fighter. We'll also be talking about his coaching career that first began with the Muskegon Lumberjacks in 1986, where he was a player assistant coach. In addition to being the proud owner of an uncommon amount of different addresses around North America, his coaching career still continues today as he recently returned from his latest gig in Alaska earlier this spring. But at one time, he was at the top of the mountain when he was the head coach of the Ottawa Senators. That's where I first crossed paths with Coach Allison when he was the head coach of the Senators American Hockey League affiliate, the Prince Edward Island Senators. So we have a lot to talk about and we probably should get started. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Dave Allison to the show. Coach Allison, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Well, I sure appreciate you having me on, Lance. Man. It's great catching. It is going to be a catch-up time. I'm sorry to interrupt you there. Um, I, I remember that you have some pauses because you ponder before you speak. <laughs> uh, so, no, I'm really excited about this. This uh, uh, You were uh, a major... Uh, impact in my life at one time when I was still chasing, trying to get to the NHL. Uh, I was in my fifth season in the American Hockey League, uh, 27 year old, and that's where I met you. So we're going to talk about a lot of things, but if you don't mind, Coach, uh, well, what I do with all the guests here is I like to have you take a few minutes to hear your story. If you don't mind, let's go back to the beginning. Where'd you grow up? What was your childhood like? Your parents, brothers, sisters, friends, your introduction to hockey and other sports? Basically, give our listeners a glimpse at what it was like growing up Dave Allison. Well, you know what? I, I've been blessed. I grew up in Fort Francis, Ontario. It's it's right across from International Falls, Minnesota. And, uh, you know, came from a very athletic family, uh, my father played, and he's in the Manitoba Hall of Fame, and my mother's in the Manitoba Hall of Fame for basketball. My brother Mike was the first overall pick in the OHL draft, and he found out about it. Uh, this is how I'm going to let you know my age, but he found out about it. The draft was on Friday, and he, he, uh, my dad picked up the Saturday Globe and Mail, and uh, on Sunday told Michael he was the first overall pick for the Sudbury Wolves. <laughs> And he had a 10 year career in the National Hockey League. And both of my sisters are great athletes. And, you know, it was a great place to grow up because there were so many people that, uh, 
you know, went on and really had a great hockey career, starting with Bobby Peters, who coached in Bemidji forever and ever. Vino Gasparini lived, you know, we're friends with my parents and, and uh, you know, coached for a long time in North Dakota. Billy Selman, Art Berglund, Wayne McLeod, uh, Mike Pearson's on the mural at, uh, at uh, Mariucci Arena. Um, you know, Timmy Sheehy, Dio Sheehy, Kevin Godsity. There was just Dean Blaze. Wow. Um, there was just a lot of people from this area um, when I was growing up that uh, that were influential, especially in the U.S. hockey. And uh, it was it was great. And and uh, you know, started out and played high school hockey and went to Kenora and. And that was with the Manitoba League, and Timmy Coolis was there, and Teddy Dolphin, and uh, uh, it was a lot of fun. And, and uh, you know, I remember at Lads, it was it was a pretty good lesson. I was I was playing center at the time, and uh, I don't know why. And I, Timmy Coolis, he was a first round pick of Washington on one wing, and Warren Hanton was at the uh, on the other wing, and. Uh, you know, I uh, I was leading the league. I was leading the team with scoring. And I had a girlfriend back in Fort Francis, and uh, she said I phoned her up and I said, "Well, I'm going to stay in Kenora. I think it's the best career path for me." And she said, "Well, we're going to break up if you're going to stay there." So three days later, I'm hitchhiking back to Fort Francis, and two weeks later, we split up. And uh, Another 10 days later, when we were Milwaukee played, and I told my dad, I'm yelling at him at the bench. He was, he was helping out the Muskie team. And, and I said, I'm going back to, to Kenora. And he says, you're not going anywhere. And I says, yes, I am. And he says, this isn't a toilet seat. You made your decision, and you're going to live with it. And from then on in, from there on in, I, uh, you know, I always wanted to be in athletics, and I never let anything get in the way of, of uh where I wanted to go and what I wanted to try to accomplish. And it's been a, it's been a, it's been an eclectic journey, let me tell you. Yes, sir. Did you play any other sports besides hockey growing up? You know what? I loved football and Bronco Nagurski is from International Falls. And when I was in the 10th grade, I got offered a scholarship at the University of Minnesota and but hockey was your passion, and 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 the 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 NFL. I wasn't going to play in the NFL or anything like that. But it was. Uh, I just loved the camaraderie of what football was. I think it's just a unique sport, and uh, I'm still happy, you know, that the the path I took. But um, we lived in Europe for a year. My father taught, and uh, he exchanged, and we played cricket and. And rugby and soccer and uh, so it's it's uh, I just enjoyed sports. So you had a very athletic family. Uh, where where did you end up on the the pecking order? Are you uh, you're not the firstborn? Obviously, you said you had an older brother, but are are you the youngest or were you in the middle? No, my sister was pro- my oldest sister was probably the best athlete in the family. Um, and then I was the I was the next born, and then Michael was two years younger than I am, and my my sister Maria was a very good athlete in her own right. So we had four kids in the family, and uh, um, wonderful. Parents. Do you think that your your older sister kind of paved the way for all of you guys? Because uh, I've said this before on a number of podcasts. There's an interesting stat. There there was a study done on the world's fastest sprinters just to see if there were any uh commonalities matches that you know someone could figure out and maybe model and uh uh, put that into their program and the one that they found was uh not one of the uh, sprinters were a firstborn they were always later on you know so they always had that older sibling to chase do you remember kind of just wanting to do everything she did well, you know what? That's an interesting uh, analogy, and I, I think there's a lot of validity there, Lance. I think what happens in a small town is that they they don't get the credit that they're due because hockey, as you know, 
in Minnesota and, and, and Fort Francis, Ontario was the biggest thing. So even though my sister was a better athlete, she was always Mike Allison, Dave Allison's sister. She never got her dues um, as an athlete. And I think that, that that hurt her progression because she was excellent. And, uh, you know, it's something that we acknowledged and I think that it brought our family closer together because we never made her feel like yeah. that. Other people might have done the same thing, but it, it just it just created a bit of resilience um, moving yeah. forward. Uh, I was just up in your neck of the woods. Uh, I I didn't make the connection because I was I was up in Winnipeg, so we crossed. I drove up there in um, in May, but uh, or yeah, no, no, it was June. So we drove through Fort Francis. So next year, if we do the same thing, I'll definitely be giving you a ring if you're you're in town. But you, you mentioned how many uh, legends, like hockey legends, here in Minnesota, mm-hmm. uh, Peterson, because uh, you know Gasparini, all these people that you mentioned are, are from your area. So was it kind of just like if you didn't play hockey, you were the oddball? in that community in Fort Francis? I think it was. And and there's a lot more. You know, Mel Donnelly played for North Dakota. There was all kinds of guys. Um, and it was just a sports. But there was, like, it was easy to move across the border. And, and uh, like, like, Art Bergman was ahead of USA Hockey. Bill Selman, um you know, Wayne McLeod was the commissioner of uh, of uh, a, a division over there for crying yeah. out loud, and it was just, you know, just they 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 paved the road, and they I, I, I we they still get together, and I've been fortunate a couple times to be invited to the parties, and I love the stories and just the innocence and and the enthusiasm they still have for the game. So, when did you? kind of decide that you wanted to be a hockey player and, you know, play past your high school years, either college or junior hockey and even professionally. When did that, when did you have that ignition uh, and how did that change your, your mindset, your trajectory? Well, I, I I think when, you know, I, I was, I was in Kenora and, uh, you know, I, I could have stayed there, but uh, I just said, hey, man, I'm going to try this. I'm going to do everything I can to, to, to play hockey. I just enjoyed, again, the camaraderie. I enjoyed the sport. I just enjoyed everything about it. And I split up with this girl and said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to burn the boats. Like when Ponce de Leon got to the yeah. new world, it got a little tough. He burned the boats and said, if you can't swim back to Spain, we got to dig in here. And so I tried to dig in and ended up going and playing in junior in Cornwall and uh, and uh, enjoyed my career. So what? when did you decide to, to you know, if you – Put some points on the board. I mean, you were you were a, a skilled hockey player as well, but at some point you decided, and it happened in your junior days. But when did you decide that you know fighting was going to be the way you were going to make it, or that was the going to be the the sector that you were going to specialize in? Well, you know, I wasn't good enough to. I showed up. I think I, I don't know how I could describe myself, but I but I, I, I showed up and you know what? I showed up and I had to do things that other people, you know, might not have wanted to do. And I, I'm not telling you I wanted to do it all the time either. But, you know, I had a responsibility to to giving an umbrella of, of, of uh, you know, security in junior. And then that's what happened in pro. And I played with a lot of good guys like like Danny Jeffreyon, Timmy Bernhardt, Dave Ezard, and Cornwall, and uh, uh, it was good. It was it was good. And then uh, I ended up signing with Montreal as a college free agent or a free agent, and that was the year when the WHA came in, and we had Chrissy Dylan on our team, and uh, out of Northwestern, I think he was a seventeenth round pick, 
and he just came into that league. And Lance, we had 14 bench clearing brawls my first year pro. And <laughs> it was it like you would be shaking in your pregame nap and everything else. And Chrissy Dylan uh, was as tough as they came and a good hockey player, a really good hockey player. Played in the All-Star game and that first year, uh, after about 40-some games, he got called up to Montreal and he went into Boston. And he's a Boston native. And I think he fought Riley, O'Reilly, Jonathan and Wensink and never saw the minors again. <laughs> and he was unbelievable. But when he left, um, I guess I was the next guy up. And it's a funny story because Glenn Cochran was as tough as they come. I don't know. I don't know if you remember the name, but he played the NHL with uh, with Chicago, with Philly, and he was a good player, but he was tough. And uh, uh, do you mind if I tell oh, you no. the story? This is this is what we do. This you just do what you do. <laughs> so I must have fought him 14, 14 times. <laughs> And he kicked the crap out of me at least 12 times. But I had to give myself, I got two draws from him. And I was scouting with the Pittsburgh Penguins with Roddy Payette. And we're sitting at the uh, Edina Arena. I think we're watching Bukestead versus Gardner. And I tell Roddy the story of that. And I see it after the first intermission. Roddy Payette walks around the concourse and is talking to Glenn Cochran. Well, Glenn Cochran starts walking across the whole thing again. And I don't know whether to start to pretend I had a heart attack or start running because I thought he was going to come and beat me up for the 15th <laughs> time. But he comes up to me. He comes up to me and he says, Davey, did you tell Ronnie Payette that you beat me twice? <laughs> I says, Glenn. I never told him I beat you twice at all. I said, I told him we fought 14 times. You beat the crap out of me 12, but you got to give me two draws. <laughs> and he says, you know what? I got to admit, you were one of the only guys that put me into the hospital after I fought <laughs> you. And I thought to myself, geez, I must have caught him a couple <laughs> good ones. And I says, well, that's a story about that. He says, no, he says, I used to have to go get stitches in my hands after I beat the shit out of you every time. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what he was such a wonderful gentleman and i think that that's what you see so much in in uh in past in past years that the the, the guys that did fight each other they uh you know that was they they showed up they they did it for their team but once it was done it was done and uh they respected each other when you played you mean fighting that that was a role that was a role that someone filled that role doesn't exist in today's nhl uh it's it changed i mean i i probably caught the last end of it when i when i was playing there was still like ty domi uh was still there probert was still playing before his passing yeah. uh bugard but uh just talk talk a little bit about the code of, of fighting, you know, share some of the rules that maybe people don't know about back when you were playing. Well, it was, it was a lot of intimidation. I mean, my brother played five games in the Western league and they had to go out there and warm up separately because they'd have brawls in the warmups. I mean, we had a brawl in the warmups in, in, uh, in Binghamton, New York, and the police, it was in the warm-ups. Kenny Berry speared Alfie Samuelson, and it it just exploded, and they brought the police dogs <laughs> on the ice, Brad. I'm not kidding you. The doors open, and out come these three police dogs, and they're slip slide all over the place. <laughs> it's like, we're just, well, what is going on here? And we ended up having a second bench-clearing brawl at the end of the game. <laughs> And it was just, it was, it, it, it wasn't fun. Like it just wasn't, but it was, it was, 
I, I don't know what it was, but I'm glad the game has changed. But Doug Armstrong also told me once, he said, um, it takes more courage to score goals nowadays. Or you have to be just as tough to score goals as it does to, 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 to you know, to, to, to fight somebody. But, you know, I always just, I wanted people to have a sense of security. And I was more afraid of not showing up than getting beat up. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, hey, everybody gets beat up, and but, but you got to show up, man. Like I, 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 there, I was more afraid of not showing up than, than getting, I was up. afraid every NHL game I played before I went on the ice, just cause I, I had, I had a physical yeah. game that I had to play and I wasn't a fighter. Yeah. Uh, but once I got on the ice, you know, those butterflies went away. And I, I think Tiger Woods was quoted as saying that, you know, the, the times that I, I'm not nervous before a match, that's when I'm going to retire. Um, so you weren't, you were just, you just wanted to make sure that you didn't look bad where someone would say that guy didn't show up today. Exactly. I mean, you just have to show up that that's, I think that's what life is all about. And, you know, we, we, we protect people too much in terms of, I think you learn more from suffering, um, and you suffer less when you when you understand that there's a certain responsibility um, each of us has, and once we fulfill that responsibility, I think regardless of the endeavor, you have rights and you have privileges after that, and and it takes uh, I guess it takes a village to to uh, you know raise people and galvanize galvanize the workforce. So you played with the Cornwall. Um, Royals for junior, and then you signed and you played a, a number of years for Nova Scotia Voyagers. So that that was uh, the Montreal's uh, farm team. Uh, I look at in, you, if I include your junior career and your whole professional career, you had over just over three thousand minutes, I believe, in <laughs> in penalties, and I I imagine that most of them were fighting minutes. Uh, how did you stay healthy? I mean, there's some seasons that you were, you know, six, almost 70 games. You had seven. Yeah. You had 70, 78 games that you played uh, your third year in the AHL, 332 minutes. How didn't you miss more games? Cause of injury were you, did you just beat everyone up? No, no, I, I learned, I, no, I can't say I beat everybody up, but I, I also knew that if I was overmatched, um, you know, grab them below the elbows and be a lot more of a um, counter puncher and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I, I never really thought about it, Lance. I, uh, you know, it's 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 like your own kids. If you see your kids getting in trouble, you're not worried about what the, what's going to happen to you. You're just going to make sure that they're 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 okay. And um, I don't I, I don't know. I've never been asked that question. It's an interesting question. I you know, if you could play, yeah. you played. <laughs> you know, and and you just you just saddled up and the uh, way you went. Well, I just look at the few fights that I had. Uh, you know, hitting helmets and, you know, the the hands, you know, you guys that did it for oh. your, your job, I mean, just cuts all the time. And it just seemed like nothing ever healed. <laughs> uh, so hats off to you, Dave. I don't, I, uh, I always, every team that I played on uh, as a professional, whoever was the tough guy or tough guys on the team, uh, we went out to dinner and I paid. <laughs> Because I wanted that protection. Well, yeah, you know, I had a great relationship with it because I wasn't a fighter, but I played physical. And I, several times, uh, players that, you know, fighters, they don't get back then, they didn't get a ton of ice time. And uh, if you don't, if you get one shift and not many uh, shifts in a game and you don't have a good shift, uh, you know, you're not going to get much more. And I, guys would say, hey, Lance, I'm up next. Uh, just run someone over. I got to change the, the the tempo here. Something's not working for me. 
So that's what I would do. And, the, you know, the, they would be right there. I just hit someone and I get out of the way and the mayhem would happen. Uh, do you remember having relationships like that with players? For sure. Like Archie, I, Art, I played with Archie Henderson, Jeff Brubaker, Chris McSorley, and, and Jimmy Mann was one of my favorite guys. I mean, he knocked me out. He not, I've, I've only been knocked out once. I remember he knocked me out in the playoffs behind the net in Sherbrooke. And then he knocked my brother out with a sucker punch in Winnipeg. And we're playing together in Indianapolis. And here comes Jimmy Mann. He says, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Allison, uh, my name's Jimmy Mann, and I knocked out both your sons. <laughs> my brother said, yeah, I know, I know Jimmy. <laughs> but, you know, we, we just there was just a camaraderie in, in it. But getting back to your point, it took more toughness to play the way that you did and not have, like, fighting, you controlled the game. And you knew that what you were going to do was going to have some repercussions, but you still did it. And to me, that is toughness. Toughness is behavior. And the behavior now is different than the behavior in the past. But still, I go back to what Doug Armstrong, Ray Shiro said. It is more difficult to score goals and, and get to the front of the net or to protect the front of the net than, than just to fight. Yeah. So you had a 10-year professional career, it looks like. Uh, most of it was spent in the AHL and in the uh, International Hockey League uh, for three years, it looks like. But you did, you, you, you did it. You played in the NHL. You only played three games, but for one of the most historic uh, franchises, one of the original six in the NHL, the Montreal Canadiens. Just talk talk to the listeners about when you got the call uh, and how special that moment was for not only you, but your family and friends and all the coaches and teammates that you had uh, that, you know, kind of propelled you for that moment. You know, <clears throat> the Montreal Canadiens are without a doubt – one of the most prestigious um, organizations or businesses in the world. Um, you walk into that dressing room, and it's got a line from in, uh, from the poem in Flanders Fields that was uh, written by a Canadian soldier in World War One, and it says, "To you, with failing hands, we pass the torch. Be yours to hold it high." Mm. And they hold it high. When when I was when I was fortunate to go there, you had Larry Robinson, you had Bob Ganey, you had Guy Lafleur, you had Steve Shutt, you had Risebrow, you had all Mondu, wow. you had people that weren't only good hockey players but were so kind. Serge Savard, Guy Lapointe, they were these people. If they ran the government, we would be in a good position, and. It was, they knew your name. Like, I remember going up in an elevator and I, I, the elevator opened and there's Jean Beliveau in the back. And I get on the elevator and I, I'm, I'm petrified. I'm shaking. This is Jean Beliveau. So I get on the, I get on, I get right. This guy try to hide. And he goes, well, Red, that was a good scrimmage by you. And I'm sitting there going, I can't believe that he, those who I am. And, you know, it's Doug Armstrong's father worked there. And when his dad passed, I wrote Doug a letter and I said, you know, your father was the first person that, that you know, acknowledged that um, I could skate at least. And then, you know, what, what he did for my coaching career, um, it was such such a combination of, of, of things that, that that I so appreciated, was so grateful for. But when you get back to, your, you know, you're asking me the question, um, we didn't usually play on Saturdays in Halifax. So after practice, we'd go out and we'd have lunch and there was no cell phones and, you know, went out for lunch, got back to the, got back to my apartment and there was a message on the message machine and said, uh, Hey, we're calling you up to play against Boston today. Here's your ticket to get to the airport. So I had to rush, get my stuff, went to the airport. We played Boston. I remember I fought Davy Silk behind the net. And the next that we flew out, 
that night to go to New York and play the Rangers. Now, I didn't have my brother's phone number, and again, we had no cell phones, and I get into the the uh, the building because there's no pregame skate, and my brother's there, and I say, man, are you playing tonight? And he says, no, because uh, because uh, he's he was nursing injury, and the playoffs were going to start. And so I said, hey, you got to take the warm-up. So he found equipment to take the warm-up, Lance. And we got our picture taken at center ice. And me in my Untri Montreal away jersey and him in his home jersey. Wow. And I don't, it's the most valued memorabilia. It's probably the only thing that I value as much as anything because it just, we we. I don't know. It, it's just a, when you come down here next time, I'm going to show you the picture because I've got it up at the cabin and it's, it's, it's the best memento I have of, uh, of my career, you know? So it was, uh, it was pretty cool. Well, congratulations. Um, I never thought that I would have that moment, but I did. And I, I, I cherish it as well. And I just want to say congratulations on a, on a wonderful professional career. Uh, I'm sure you wanted to play more in the NHL, but uh, you showed up every day and I'm sure you made your mom and dad and your brother and sisters all proud of you. So uh, thank you for sharing that coach. Well, you know what you you've done the same thing with your two boys. I mean, how cool is that? That, that, you know, your mentorship, your, what you've done and both of them have played in the national hockey league. And if, I mean, it's just, it's, you're, uh, you're probably, you and Lisa are probably the biggest part. Well, you're not probably, you're the biggest part in that whole journey and that whole situation. And, uh, they've made you proud and you've made, you know, it's just, it's, it's a wonderful thing. You're so proud of them and, and it's, it's a lifelong dream and, and uh it's a wonderful yes, sport it is and uh yes uh it's been a uh an incredible journey and you know we're still on it so uh back yeah. to you we're not talking about me yet coach um we'll get to that <laughs> soon as we transition into uh your career when you got into coaching how did that kind of happen did you know you were gonna i mean we all know when our our careers come into the the final last leg of the, the tour, so to speak. Uh, did you know that you were going to be a coach or did you have uh, aspirations of doing something else when you retired? I went to coaching seminars um, while I was still playing. I went to Cal Botterill's uh, coaching clinic about uh, mental preparation, Dave King, and, and, and it was something I wanted to do. Both my parents were teachers and – I just, I, I, co I played for a lot of really good guys, John Brophy, Burt Templeton, you know, Larry Kish, and, and I just thought I could have significance. I, again, um, I thought the experiences that I had about just showing up um, were valuable, and I just enjoyed galvanizing a, a group of kid, a group of players to have humility and gratefulness and 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 uh, learn how to win. So you you started in Muskegon in eighty six eighty seven. So that's uh, that was my first year college, and okay. Uh, so you were with Muskegon there, and it's funny. Both of my boys played in Muskegon in the USHL, <laughs> and. And yeah, you had some coaching yeah. in there. Um, you end up getting a, a, a head job for the Kingston Frontenacs. And then in 1994-95, that's when uh, you and I crossed paths uh, with the Ottawa Senators organization. So uh, talk about how you got that job with Ottawa. Uh, you started in Prince Edward Island and... Paralleling your uh, your playing career, you got a little taste of the NHL, three games with Montreal, and the same thing. You made it to the top of the mountain. You had a head coaching job with the Ottawa Senators for 25 games. 
uh, and then that that was over. And I I have to say that when you went there, that that team was in. It was much like when I was in the with the Florida Panthers. They had so much uh, term not turmoil, but there was turnover. They you know they they were rebuilding, restructuring, and and you were part of that. And uh, but just talk about how you got there, and then. I'm sure we'll have some banter back and forth as far as uh, you and I uh, being on the same team together uh, and you leading us. So start, if you would, please. Well, you know what, Patty, I played 10 years and Patty Morris was, um, was a friend of mine and a, and a good agent. And I went to Montreal and, and, and I ended up, I, for, my first job was in Roanoke, Virginia in the East Coast Hockey League. And we had... John Brophy is a coach, Archie Henderson, Chris McSorley, Jeff Brubaker, Stevie Carlson, and it was a heck of a league. And then I ended up in Richmond. I ended up in uh, Albany, and we folded. Um, we ended up folding because we didn't have enough money. And then that's when, again, Patty Morris really helped me out with Ren Blair. And Ren Blair hired me in Kingston. And... The team was in a was in the team was the a last place team when we got there. But I really, really enjoyed it. My brother came and we coached together in Kingston. We had guys like Chris Gratton, who was a first round pick, Brett Lindros, Chad Kilger, Craig Reve. We had just a one David Ling. We had a wonderful group, and we turned it around. And they turned it around, and uh, I was there for two years and then I really wanted to get into pro again and I love the American Hockey League. I think that that's where you can have the biggest impact in a lot of ways because they're good players but you're taking them to a different level but um, I was there and then I knew Randy Sexton we played together briefly in Cornwall, and Ray Shiro was an agent, and he was a great advocate helping me get players in the East Coast League and everything else. And In fact, my brother played for his father with the New York Rangers when he turned pro. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, similarities in, in having those guys help me get to where uh, I went, and I, I flew to Hartford. And interviewed with Randy and Ray and and John Ferguson was there at the time and uh, got the job. And then, if you remember, um, we all went into PEI and a lot of people were going, you know, PEI, Prince Edward Island. What the hell are you doing going there? But you guys went in there because you were. They saw something in so many of you guys that you could either help them. As a, as, a, as a regular player or, or a depth guy, but there was the NHL strike. Yep. So everybody that got there, you know, we started off 0-10. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, what is going on? So I, I don't know if you remember this, but we were, we were in uh, Portland, and I, and I brought the older guys out in groups of two or three, and I just said, hey, fellas, it's not my fault. I didn't call the strike, but we got to get on the same yeah. page here. And as long as it's not malicious or absolutely idiotic, we got to get together and start to play here. Like, this is a good town. And we had some great players, yourself, Foster, uh, Stevie LaRouche. Um, Pavel Dimitra. You know. Pavel Dimitra, um, Mike Bales, Michelle Picard, I mean, Darcy Simon, the list goes on and on. And, and you guys ended up being in first place. And we beat Calgary's farm team, St. John, in the first round. Then we lost to Fredericton for crying out loud. We had a bunch of in injuries. And, you know, the rest is the, the rest of this, that history. But it was probably one of the best times of my life. And you were our captain. And you did so much to galvanize the team and just temper because, hey, I was covered from junior. But I still believed in certain things that you had to have gratefulness, that you had to have humility, that we had to show up. And I remember we went into Hershey and I think we had 14 guys and we won them. And it was the fifth game and six nights or whatever. But that team had 
had volition, man. They played with a will and a want to get there. And a lot of you guys played in the National Hockey League. And, you know, that next year, um, we were on a 10-game road trip and got back. And they were struggling in, in, in Ottawa at the time. And Ricky Bonus and Alan Vigneault and, and uh, um, Randy and Ray Fomey and said, uh, you know, hey, we're going to make a coaching change. And uh, I said, oh, yeah, who? I said, you. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, okay, and uh, you know it, 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 it was. Uh, um, I mean, there, there was. There's always difficulties wherever you go, but you know what? It, it, it turned. It was. It was a wonderful opportunity, and you know, it brought you up there as well, and then you, you your career took off. And uh, I think we just needed some more time. And, you know, there were some injuries and everything. But And I can understand uh, um, what happened. I mean, I don't blame them. And, uh, you know, they made that trade to get Damien Rhodes and, and, and the coaching change. Um, Mr. Martin was an excellent coach, and that's what they needed at the time with some more experience. And they took off. And there were some great players there, uh, Yashin, um, you know, just just a lot of guys, and it, it it gave you a catapult for your career, and then you signed with Florida, and 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 uh, it's amazing how things happen. It is, um, and I I have to. I don't think I've ever thanked you, but it when I I played four years, I I, I turned pro when I was twenty two years old, so I was four years of college, then turned pro. Um, my when I was in Hershey. I was one of the young guys. I mean, we had a, a, an old team, Tim Tukey, my best buddy. He was like 27. I'm like, are you retiring yeah. soon? <laughs> you know? And then all yeah. of a sudden yeah. I'm 26, 27. And I go to Prince Edward Island, sign with Ottawa. And I'm the young, I'm, I'm, I'm an old guy on that team. Everyone's young. And somehow you saw something in me and, and this is what I'm thanking you for, but you, you made me the captain of that team. And I don't know why, but uh, because I didn't, we never crossed paths before that. But, you know, that you talked about how special that first year was. It was. And I ended up uh, playing in the All Star game, uh, in the AHL All Star game. And, yes. and uh, you know, the, the following year, uh, you get the, the job. And uh, I don't, it, tell me this, but you got the job. Do they give you like, okay, you're going to be the head coach of the Ottawa Senators. If there's someone down there that you want to call up here to throw them a, a bone for everything that they did down there for you, does that happen? But, you know, you got the job and you called, you got me called up. So thank you for both things and uh, helping me get to the NHL. Well, you know what? Pierre Maguire and it was, was, was a big help along the way and Chico Rush was the other assistant coach but what you brought to the table was humility and gratitude and I think that there was too many people being victims there and whether you were 27 or 22 what I did really believe is that you were going to come in there with a sense with a sense of enthusiasm a sense of courage um, a sense of that toughness just by your behavior and and gratitude to be there. And that is such an important component as you galvanize a group of people to have a common goal. And you embraced it. And, you know, you made that team, you know, it's like Trent McCleary. Trent, remember Trent McLaren yes. guards? I remember we were having a meeting and I was pissed off at people because they weren't doing, they weren't showing up. And I brought up some things to certain people. And I, and finally I went to McLeary and I went to Gardner and I says, you two guys, you two guys, you guys are embarrassing everybody on the team because every gosh darn day you show up and you compete and you do make everything around you better. You guys 
got to quit doing it because you're embarrassing the rest of these guys <laughs> on the stage. And, and it, everybody started to laugh. And I think that that humor is such a great way to get your point across. But everybody realized that Trent McCleary and Gardner just came to play the same as you. Yeah. And you have to have those people. You're not only good players, but you galvanized people around you. You made sure that they showed up because if they didn't, they would have been embarrassed. Yep. And uh, you're, you look out of place if you're on a, a rink with a team that everyone is busting their butt and you're not. Uh, I have to tell, I have to exactly. tell one story about how you, <laughs> you were just saying how you were talking to the boys. So we were in Anaheim in the NHL and, oh, and I had uh, a cracked cheekbone, but I could still play. I had a full uh, mask on. I had the, the aquarium, I think you called it <laughs> on <laughs> and we didn't have a very good first period as a team. And, but I was the guy that you were calling out that game and you pulled me into your office. I was grateful that you, you didn't do it in front of the team, but you go, Lance, you got a full, full mask on full face cover. Why aren't you a bowling ball out there? You should be running over everyone. What are they going to do? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it sparked me because, uh, with your enthusiasm and, uh, you know, but uh, that, you know, you might have, you, I would say, out of all the coaches that I had, were the most unique in your presentation to players on, and the team on what you would like to have us do. You know, you put some thought into things before you thought, you know, set it to the team. And, uh, you know, some of it was hilarious. Some of it, I'm sure that you know, there was... A couple times, I'm sure you wish you uh, wouldn't have said it, but uh, all I know is that we were all thinking about what you had said long after you said it. So, uh, yeah, that was just a, a fun story. Uh, but we had we had some fun times, Coach. No, we did. We really, really did. I mean, that's the game that Denny Vial was killing that five on three. <laughs> oh, I remember that as well, Lance. There was a lot of fun time, man. A lot of fun time. I, hey, I, our first daughter was born in, in Richmond, Ontario, Richmond, Virginia, and Olivia was born in, uh, in PEI. And uh, I, I love the Maritimes. I just absolutely love the Maritimes. I love the players on that team. And uh, it, it, they're great yeah, matters. That, that was that we, my wife, Lisa and I, we absolutely uh, loved. PEI and are actually planning on maybe taking a train trip out there. Um, probably not this fall, but the, the next fall, maybe start in Ottawa and then take a train across and then hit the Maritimes, end up in PEI because we still have uh, some friends that we are in contact with from when we played there. So awesome. Uh, are you still coaching now? Are you, I mean, are you, I know you were last year in Alaska. Uh, what team was that for? And then are you back there again for this year? You know what? I I was up and uh, I was back home, and and uh, I called Rob Prophet because uh, um, I heard he was looking for a coach two years ago, and I all I love the outdoors, and I love I want always wanted to go to Alaska, and I I, re I met the guy once in Des Moines, and he he really captured me, and I ended up going up there, and I really enjoyed it. But you know what, Lance? I, I mean, with with, it was it was a bit. I'm glad I went, but I ended up being so far away from so many people that that, you know, I loved like and lost a lot of friends. We've all lost a lot of friends, um, in the last little while with COVID and as you yeah. get older, and I just said, you know what, I gotta get closer, um. And find something that uh, um, with significance and with more significance, and uh, just seeing what happens. And uh, uh, because I've done different things, I've done the college free agency, and I, I was very fortunate to scout Ray Shiro again. As uh, you know, hired me as a scout, and and I did uh, college free agency, and I did the um, 
the U.S. and 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 did a lot of different things with him and and Doug Armstrong and Randy Sexton and and uh, I've been very fortunate that there are a lot of people have uh, have trusted me and 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 given me opportunities and it's 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 been eclectic, man. Like you know, USHL, North American League, OHL, IHL. Uh, different places and each place is, uh, has been, has been a wonderful experience. So to answer your question, no, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, coaching right now. We'll see what happens, whether it's either coaching or, or scouting or something like that. Uh, we'll see how it all goes. But if you got another opportunity, you would like to still continue on being part of the game? I really enjoy the game. And I enjoy the people. And I think I've got some practical wisdom and empathy, not sympathy, but empathy um, towards what these kids are going through. And I think, again, the biggest thing that they have to find is, is finding responsibility. Because once you take responsibility, you have rights and you have privileges. And... You know, it, it does start with, like, Angela Duckworth has got a great TED Talk, and she talks the biggest indicator of success in, in young people is grit. And grit is four things. It's a passion for your craft. It's willing to work at that craft. It's doing it for more than yourself, and it's a growth mindset. Now, I think this word, the growth mindset, is used too often because it's it's just an attitude, and that attitude has to be one of humility and of gratitude. And I think especially in this day and age, the Ted Lasso mantra of be curious, not judgmental. So when we're dealing even with our own kids, um, you almost have to ask the question, why seven times before they find the truth of how they're going to maximize their abilities? You, uh, are you a big reader? Yeah, I, 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 I enjoy reading. I live on an island in the summertime. It's five, six miles by boat. And if you have a cabin, it's manual yeah. labor. But I, I, I enjoy reading. I enjoy um, just finding out what makes people tick. Yeah. Uh I I never even, you know, that question didn't even pop into my head, but you always seem to have some quote or something that you were uh, putting into the universe for all of us players to, to gnaw on and think about. And, uh, you know, you, you did, you, you said that you just want to help players be the best that they can. And uh, I remember that and you did that every day that, you know, you were a coach of mine. So uh, on behalf of all of the players that have been underneath you, thank you. Cause uh, we, we appreciated your guidance. Well, you know, I always looked at, they were, we were together and I, I, you know, I, it's funny you say that. I remember the movie on the waterfront with Marlon Brando when he was a boxer and he was sitting at the table and it was a black and white show. And he said, you should have helped me, Mickey. You were my brother. I could have been the heavyweight champ of the world. And it always stuck with me. That my job was not to be liked necessarily. My job was to make sure that none of you had regrets. That you knew exactly what it was and the courage it took um, to get to where you're capable of going. And it was so nice to see you when you signed that four-year deal with Florida and so many other guys. And I've received some very, very um, heartwarming notes from them or even their parents. Yeah, no, that's, it's a journey. Uh, it's a journey. That's for doggone sure. And, you know, when you're in a season, I mean, that, that team is your family for the year and, um, you spend a lot of time with each other. So, um, you made it always, uh, you know, I guess, uh, worth remembering. <laughs> oh, we yes. had some fun. 
and we had some fun. And I know you guys had some fun, but you know what? You showed up, baby. And we had Gutter. Oh, we had Gutter Garrett, who was just do, priceless. Do, do you remember the, him? Because uh, it was during the OJ trial. You would want something. He was like, don't bug me. OJ's on. Watching the trial. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And Schnitzy would have to go get it. And then we had we had the uh, we had the sauna, and then Moosehead Breweries was our sponsor. <laughs> and like it was on strike, so when Ray and Randy and Pierre would come down, we'd be sitting there in the in the sauna with the Moosehead <laughs> beer. And I mean, and, and, but but I'm telling you, we yes. showed up. We sh you guys showed up, man. Yeah. If we hadn't had those injuries and they didn't have. Uh, we had a good team. We had a great team. Yeah, it does. It goes to show you how hard it is to win a doggone championship. I, I that was one year, and I there was one year when I played in Florida that I thought, okay, this 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 team is special. So, um, yeah, man, what a journey. So, a couple more questions, coach. Then I'll let you go. Uh, you spent some time in the USHL, um, and then in the I, I believe the OHL uh, junior hockey, but. You know, a lot of a lot of the players that I, I get to get in front of are younger uh, and they have that objective to, to play college hockey, to to play past 18 years old, uh, females, too. But, you know, what what are what's some advice that you can give to, to players today in, that are chasing this journey? You know, what 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 should they be doing? What What's the best practices? What can you share with them? The Curtis Brackenberry has been a real good friend of mine, and he's 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 incredible in terms of how he 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 looks at things, and he's really helped me out. Um, but I remember we had uh, James Neal and Louis Erickson, and both were second round picks. And I'll I'll just give you a little more background when I when I left. Um, Nashville. I came home because my father had Alzheimer's and I said, you know what? I'm going to go back. I'm going to coach the, the junior team here. And I was here for three years and then the team was folding and I got hired by Doug Armstrong and I was at the lowest, not the lowest level, but, uh, and, and Timmy Bernhardt helped me get them because he, he recommended me. And then Doug had called Ray and, 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 and Randy and, and, and uh, Pierre McGuire. And he hired me to take over. Um, it was a new franchise starting in, in Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa. And the Iowa Stars. And, like, that's how lucky and fortunate I've been, Lance. So when we got there, we had the two second round picks, James Neal and Louis Erickson. And James Neal had one goal after 38 games at Christmas, and Louis Erickson had two goals. And they were struggling listening. They didn't, like, they thought they could come and play the same game in junior or in the, in the uh, Swedish league and have success and play in the National Hockey League. And so I got James Neal into the dressing room, and I said, James, what would you do to play in the National Hockey League? And he says, Davey, I'll do anything. Like, I'll do anything. And I said, well, James, I'm going out to get you a gun. And he says, what are you talking about? I said, James, you're going to have to shoot Brendan Borrow, <laughs> Steve Ott, and the other guy. I can't remember um, who the other le left winger was in order to play with the Dallas Stars because you got no hope in hell of playing over them the way you're playing now. <laughs> I said, anything, you don't have to kill anybody. This is what you have to do. You have to compete, you have to support, and you have to do it with intelligence. And he, I said, do you think you can do that? He says, I think I can. And I said it to both of them at different stages, and that's all they started to focus on. It wasn't about scoring goals. It wasn't about there, but you've got to be competitive. You have to have hockey sense and you have to have support for your teammates. And those things go right back to what we were talking about. Humility. Not thinking less of yourself, but thinking more of other people. Gratitude. And just being curious about how you can get better. And we had, out of that team in three years, 
Lance, 21 guys played over 150 games. Matt Green, wow. uh, Nicholas Grothman, Steve Smith, Danny Ellis. That was that was comparable to that PEI team. So when people want to know, they think there's a they, they, they think there's a magic elixir. It's not. You've got to be competitive. You've got to have hockey sense, and you've got to support other people. And those are the things, I think, that carry you for the rest of your life. I mean, what do you admire in your parents? You admire that they work hard, they do it with intelligence, and they do it with support to the family. Well, the flip side of those things aren't too good moving forward, be it lazy, stupid, and unsupportive, selfish. So to me, that's all it is, as long as you have talent. Yeah. yeah. So, so, But you've done a great job with your thing because it's about skill. You've got skill development, but that skill development is still three pronged, you know, because you've got to get involved in the in in the battle. You've got to win more than you lose, and then you have to be able to do something with the puck when you win that yeah. battle. Yeah, such great messaging, coach. As always, uh, <laughs> you should be a motivational speaker. My last question for you is. Um, how do you hope to be remembered? You know, what 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 legacy do you want to leave behind when you're uh, done with this game? Um, he showed up. He he uh, saw us. <clears throat> um. You just, I think I'm kind, um, but I, I, I think you just want to show up and you want to make the world around you or the people, let them maximize um, their life. And it's, it's not easy. It's just, it's not easy, but uh, it's a wonderful life. It is a wonderful life. And I'm glad that you were a part of mine, uh, Coach, for sure. So um, congratulations on amazing an amazing hockey career as a player. And thank you, Coach Allison, for your life commitment to the sport. Uh, you can't be around the game as long as you have if you're a bad person. So You've been doing something right to keep getting all these opportunities that you've gotten. Uh, all I know is that when our paths crossed, I knew I want I wanted every player that was uh, you wanted every player that was under your guidance uh, to become a better version of themselves and to reach the the highest level, whatever that would have been. So thanks for making the game of hockey uh, not a little better, a lot better. Uh, than when you found a coach and uh, continued success. Well, I sure appreciate you because you did you did make our team better, and that gave me opportunities as well. So you, we both um, we can reciprocate and pay it forward. And I I, I really do appreciate. Um, I don't think back much on on this stuff because you're looking forward. You still remember this stuff, but. I so appreciate uh, uh, you having me on and uh, letting me rehash or remember um, just the people that have helped me and uh, and the fun we had and just just talking about it. I mean, I I I love memories. Memories are are fantastic, and um, you know that's why this podcast is called the Hockey Journey Podcast because uh, we all have different stories but if you really get down to the core of it it's all the same we're all the same uh, we have moments that are different but it's all the same and um, like you said humility gratitude and show up it's all you got to do people thanks dave for being here let me just say one more thing i got to recognize travis richards too because he's a friend of both of ours and when I went to Grand Rapids and Bob McNamara was there, and, um, Travis Richards was another wonderful human being that uh, meant a lot to both of us. It means a lot to both of us because he's still plugging away with uh, 
with with his team in in Grand Rapids, and he's a guy that uh, love as much as you and a lot of the other guys, man. No, nope, it's uh, like I said, you don't. If you're bad, um, I should say, if you're good, it spreads pretty quick. If you're bad, it spreads even quicker. Um, you don't get those opportunities unless you're a quality human being and, you know, people look out for each other. So uh, you gave me an opportunity. We we helped each other. But again, Coach, just thanks for taking the time to be on here. You were a fantastic interview with great messaging. Uh, and if you're going to be back in the, the game of hockey, uh, I'll be watching to see how you're doing. They, and we're going to go to the border bar when you come across to International Falls, Fort Francis, because that's good pizza. Big All right. Fella. I can't wait for that. So thanks again for being here, Dave. You'll always be. Thank you'll always you, be. And good luck to those boys and Lisa. Say hello to Lisa. I, will, I will do that. And uh, you will always be coach to me. All right, Dave. <laughs> All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed meeting Dave Allison and hearing his hockey journey, both as a player and coach, my coach, when I played for the Ottawa Senators. Great memories with him up in Canada those couple years. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon. And do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.